Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com. Today, we're going to take an introductory overview to one of my favorite genres and dive into the history of the Hollywood movie musical. Let's set the stage for the beginning of our story. It's the Roaring Twenties. By now, film was a young but a vibrant industry. Filmmaking pioneers had escaped the reaches of Edison's motion picture patent company and settled out west in Hollywood, churning out films year-round with California's moderate climate. Movie studios began to merge and conglomerate into the brands that we're familiar with today. Famous players Lasky was becoming paramount. Metro Pictures Corporation, Goldwyn Pictures, and Louis B. Mayer would come together in MGM. The industry was moving away from the small craft to big factory style movie making businesses. Now this was also the era of the silent film giants like Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Greta Garbo, Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and many more. Uh, things were in full swing. Uh, sure, there were some holdouts that thought film would be a passing fad, but these guys were living large and raking in the dough. But back on the East Coast, an inventor by the name of Lee DeForest was experimenting with something new, capturing sound on film. Now, he produced over 1,000 experimental shorts, many including musical segments borrowing vaudeville stars like this song by Eddie Cantor from 1923. Now, even though DeForest's films were a relatively big hit with audiences, the Hollywood studios just weren't that interested in sound. Why should they be when they were making money left and right on silent pictures? The industry needed a push, and it would take Warner Brothers, a studio that wasn't making money, even posting a net loss of 333000 at the beginning of 1926, to take a big bet on the future of sound in pictures. In August of 26, the first Warner Brothers Vitaphone picture, Don Juan, premiered to great reception. It wasn't a talking picture. It was basically a silent film with a recorded synchronized soundtrack, but audiences loved it. Warner Brothers doubled down on sound, announcing that all films produced in 1927 would feature synchronized sound. And on October 6, 1927, Warner Brothers premiered a film so devastating to silent film that people today often mistakenly call it the first talking picture. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. Wait a minute, I tell you, you ain't heard nothing. The jazz singer wasn't even a full-fledged talking. It was mostly silent with a few musical numbers, but those numbers were the straws that broke silent films back. According to Sam Goldwyn's wife, Frances, the celebrities in the audiences for the jazz singer had, quote, terror in all their faces as they knew the game they had been playing for years was finally over. Now, the conversion to sound didn't happen immediately after the jazz singer premiere. It took a few more hits, like the all-talking The Lights of New York in 1928, which included a few musical numbers, to convince the studios that people were hungry for sound. Now, by 1929, silent films were being slaughtered at the box office. The entire industry was retooled in a matter of just two short years. And what better way to showcase sound than with a song and dance? Sound was such a sensation that all the major studios were clamoring to pump out musicals. In 1929, MGM released what they billed as their first all-talking, all-singing, all-dancing feature, Broadway Melody. Produced by MGM production chief Irving Thalberg in just 28 days, Broadway Melody brought two important advancements to film, the practice of sound editing and pre-recorded soundtrack. Now, during the hurried production, the filmmakers discovered a mistake and needed to reshoot a scene. A sound technician Douglas Schurer suggested they save some money by using the existing recorded soundtrack and just film new visuals. 
Now this freed up the camera to move about because at that point with cameras being so loud, they had to shoot from a soundproof booth. Now the practice of shooting musical segments using pre-recorded soundtrack lasts to this day. Broadway Melody was an unquestionable hit at the time, costing a substantial $379,000 to produce. It grossed 4.3 million worldwide and became the first musical and first sound picture to win Best Picture at the 1929 Academy Awards, which happened to be the second Academy Awards ceremony. A Warner Brothers answered Broadway Melody with Gold Diggers of Broadway, adding Technicolor's two-strip color to the musical. Gold Diggers became another huge hit, though the original film is now considered lost. Now, the novelty of sound was winning over contemporary audiences, so much so that every studio started pumping out musicals. Perhaps the most notable was MGM's The Hollywood Review of 1929, which may be most memorable for the origin of the song, Singing in the Rain, as seen in this finale here with a brief cameo by Buster Keaton. On the bizarre front, we also see the first and only musical shot by Cecil B. DeMille, Madame Satan which takes place at a costume party aboard a Zeppelin. In 1930 alone, over 100 musicals were produced. That's two new musical films a week. And this is during an era with the single screen theater. Hollywood was running out of ideas and just throwing musicals on the screen as a cash grab. And since the theaters were owned by the studios, they were forced to show the films for weeks at a time. By the end of 1930, audiences stopped showing up. The oversaturation of the musical, along with the effects of the stock market crash in 29 and the beginning of the Great Depression, saw a dip in attendance and the studios began to feel the pinch. With the rise of free radio entertainment, audiences were reluctant to spend their hard-earned pennies for what was essentially filmed vaudeville. Uh, coming from a high of 100 musicals produced in 1930, Hollywood scaled back, producing only 14 musicals in 1931, even going so far as to slash musical numbers out of films. Uh, theaters began to advertise a film as not a musical. Even Technicolor Two Strips suffered the musical backlash. Audiences had become began to associate color with musical and stayed away. A Broadway composer and lyricist pair Rogers and Hart would write a few well-received musicals, including introducing America to Maurice Chevalier in Love Me Tonight in 1932. But by the close of that year, it was becoming apparent that the film musical was dead. It would take pure artistry to bring it back. The resurgence of the musical and launch of the genre into the golden age began with two men. First was Broadway dance director Busby Berkeley. Accorded out to Hollywood by Samuel Goldwyn in 1930, it was his work for Warner Brothers starting in 1933 that revealed his true genius. The Great Depression had really hit Warner Brothers hard and the studio, despite kicking off the sound era, desperately needed a hit. It would come in a surprise 1933 film, 42nd Street, a backstage musical about a producer on the ropes and a chorus girl who has to replace the star at the last moment. Berkeley only directed the dancing sequences, but he understood more than his contemporaries at the time that the camera had to move with the dancers. Using pre-recorded tracks, he freed the camera from the soundproof booth and made it part of the dance routine. This took the musical off the stage and created perspectives that no Broadway ticket holder could see, building a new artistic hybrid of song and visual. Now, Warner Brothers quickly recognized Berkeley's talent and put him to work on their big musicals, such as the remake Gold Diggers of 1933, Footlight Parade, which includes his astounding By the Waterfall sequence, Dames, and Gold Diggers of 1935. 
Now what Berkeley did in movement and staging behind the scenes, Fred Astaire would do in front of the camera. Uh, Fred Astaire, who left a pretty successful stage career for Hollywood, was cast by RKO in a minor role of a band leader in Flying Down to Rio in 1933. Uh, given a free choice of starlets as his dancing partner, Astaire chose Ginger Rogers, who had worked with him before. The result was probably the most memorable scene of the entire film. Producer Pandro S. Berman persuaded RKO, RKO to put Astaire and Rogers in their own feature, resulting in another hit, The Gay Divorcee. The pair was brought out again for what might be their iconic film, Top Hat, with a stellar score by Irving Berlin, which includes the classic Cheek to Cheek. Now, before we leave the early 30s and enter the golden era of Hollywood musicals, we would be remiss not to at least mention an early player in the history of sound, Walt Disney. It could be said that he built the Walt Disney Company on sound, from the first musical cartoon, Steamboat Willie, in 1928, to his silly symphonies starting in 1929. As you, as you can probably guess, musicals and Disney kind of go hand in hand. But at this point in history, the musical belonged to the king of studios, Metro Goldwyn Mayer. By the mid thirties, the musical had recovered from the cheap productions that saturated the market at the turn of the decade to become a powerful prestige genre. Busby Berkeley showed that you needed artistry in the camera and the art direction, and Astaire showed you needed talented stars. And no studio was better positioned to deliver on both fronts than Metro Goldwyn Mayer. MGM had a close affiliation with Chase National Bank, giving it nearly unlimited access to capital with national exhibition guaranteed by parent company Lowell's Incorporated, which dominated the theater market. Run by a ruthless Louis B. Mayer, it was the artistic direction of production manager Irving Thalberg and later David O. Selznick that kept production quality high and MGM contracted the best talent. As one PR slogan read, more stars than there are in heaven. Which brings us to probably the most beloved movie of the golden age of Hollywood, a musical, The Wizard of Oz. Now, Oz would be the first producer job, albeit uncredited, for Arthur Freed, a song lyricist who worked at MGM. Freed kept pressing Louis B. Mayer for producing roles. Uh, after the success of The Wizard of Oz, Mayer gave him producer role for Babes in Arms, again starring Judy Garland, pairing her up with Mickey Rooney in a low budget film released just four months after Oz. Uh, it brought in millions, which led to a series of let's put on a show or backyard musicals, a trope where all the characters' problems are solved by putting on a show, which included Strike Up the Band the following year, Babes on Broadway in 1941, and Girl Crazy in 1943. Uh, by the mid-40s, Freed was essentially running his own independent production unit under MGM, creating genre-defining musicals of the era that included Easter Parade, 1948, which brought back Fred Astaire from semi-retirement, On the Town in 1949, An American in Paris, 1951, and Singing in the Rain in 1952, which some consider the best film musical of that era or any era. I remember that title song? It was originally from the Hollywood Review of 1929, lyrics by Arthur Freed. And that song, Good Morning, that was from Babes in Arms with lyricist, you guessed it, Arthur Freed. In fact, all the music except for a couple songs was by Freed and composer Nacio Herb Brown. But the environment for musicals was changing and MGM's musical formula would become old and give way to a new, more tightly interwoven narrative, the book musical.
To understand the modern movie musical, we have to take a brief detour into the world of live musical theater. And no partnership is more important to musical theater history than that of Oscar Hammerstein II and Richard Rodgers. The common practice of the first half of the 20th century was to write the music first and then come up with the lyrics afterward. Now this is a good practice for coming up with great songs. In fact, most of the great American songbook came from musicals created this way. But when Rodgers and Hammerstein went to write a musical based on the unsuccessful play Green Grow the Lilacs, they felt it needed something more than the standard musical comedy treatment. After all, it was about cowboys on the frontier and murder and rape and sexual innuendo. Well, Hammerstein poured over the lyrics on his farm in Pennsylvania and it would telegraph or phone his work to his musical partner Rogers working on his farm in upstate New York, who would come up with the music. Every line was painstakingly crafted. When the show previewed in New Haven as Away We Go in March of 1943, Variety panned it. And Walter Winchell's column handed down the line, no girls, no gags, no chance. Rogers and Hammerstein continued working on the book and previewed in Boston. Something began to gel, and the name of the musical was changed to reflect the rousing central number. Oklahoma opened on Broadway on March 31st, 1943, without much fanfare. But audiences started coming in as word of a new kind of musical spread. It would eventually smash Broadway records, running for a total of 2,212 performances. A musical had completely changed. As Berkeley and Astaire demonstrated that you needed to have great camera and performances, Hammerstein and Rogers showed you had to have songs and sequences that always propelled the story forward. Virtually every musical performed today by professional and amateur theater houses, with the exception of Anything Goes because Cole Porter is just special that way, comes from the tradition set forth by Oklahoma. And virtually every big Hollywood musical would pull from this Broadway tradition. As the MGM original musical and the entire studio system came to a close in the 50s with Gigi in 1959, Hollywood began to tap Broadway for source material, from West Side Story in 1961 to Music Man in 62 and My Fair Lady in 64. For My Fair Lady, producer Jack Warner kept Rex Harrison from the stage version, but rejected the original Liza Doolittle, a young Julie Andrews, as being unphotogenic. Instead, Audrey Hepburn was cast with Marnie Nixon dubbing in the singing. Julie Andrews instead was brought in by Walt Disney to play the leading role in Mary Poppins, which was one of the great musicals of this era, earning Andrews the Oscar for Best Actress, while Hepburn didn't even get nominated. Andrews and Hepburn showed amazing grace to one another, and when Rex Harrison won the Best Lead, he dedicated his Oscar to both his fair ladies, Audrey and Julie. Jack Warner's comment on Julie Andrews would prove false yet again in 1965's The Sound of Music. A 20th Century Fox was on the brink of bankruptcy after a failed historical epic, Cleopatra, nearly tanked the studio. They bet $8.2 million on Sound of Music, which ran for an unprecedented four years in theaters, becoming the most profitable musical of the 60s, as well as winning five Oscars. With the exception of the Elvis films of the era, almost all musicals of the 60s were retreads of Broadway properties. Without a strong studio system with musical staff on payroll, Hollywood filmmakers had to turn to Broadway for strong, tested material. But Hollywood as a whole didn't have a good eye for talent, and a lot of big musical films bombed at the box office. Heading into the 70s, musicals began to look like an aging dinosaur again, especially compared to the gritty realism of New Hollywood. 
There were a few standouts that showed the musical had some legs. Films like Fiddler on the Roof from 1971 captured the heart of the show, was bolstered by a terrific performance by Israeli actor Topol. Bob Fosse's Cabaret in 1972. Now, Bob Fosse is, in my opinion, one of the great visual film directors that's only starting to become recognized for his true genius. Jesus Christ Superstar in 73, The Who's Tommy in 1975, which happens to be the same year that they debuted the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which in some form or another is still playing in theaters to this day, and Grease in 1978. But times, they were a-changing. By the time Jaws and Star Wars came out in 1975 and 77, the musical had been supplanted as a money-making tentpole film. Even a successful Broadway run wasn't enough to guarantee profits for a film version. The musical at that point became confined to family and animated genres. A standout would be Little Shop of Horrors, a remarkably catchy Motown production based on Roger Corman's B-movie, which had some dark undertones but made really family accessible by puppeteer turned director Frank Oz in 1986. Then we have the second golden age of Disney from Little Mermaid in 89, Beauty and the Beast in 91, Aladdin in 92, and Lion King in 94, introducing a young generation to the musical genre, a generation that would grow up and lampoon it in 1999's South Park, bigger, longer, and uncut. Chicago in 2002 was what I consider the last great musical film. It won the Oscar that year because of its ingenious staging of the musical numbers that blended the backstage musical with a story about media and jury manipulation that felt contemporary in a 24-hour news coverage of high-profile trials, even though the show was originally produced in 1975. Unfortunately, it is an outlier, as modern productions of musicals simply fall flat. The Producers from 2005, a film adaptation of a musical adaptation of Mel Brooks's classic film, which was one of the funniest productions ever produced for the stage, lost all charm in its lifeless transition to film. Hairspray, yet another film adaptation of a musical adaptation of a John Waters classic, gave us the incredibly creepy female John Travolta, a role originally played by Divine and then Harvey Firestein on the stage. We bought the charm of Divine and Firestein, not so much with Travolta. And then there was the much heralded Les Miserables, which could have taken a cue from 1975's At Long Last Love, where Peter Bagdanovich also attempted to record a musical film with live singing, which ended in pretty disastrous results. Sure, Les Mis gave Anne Hathaway her first Oscar, but her performance of I Dreamed a Dream can't even match Susan Boyle's ineffectiveness, and that made the bad British man smile. And then there's the latest stab by the Academy to convince the public that musicals are still relevant. Damien Chazelle's sophomore Oscar contender La La Land in 2016. A critical hit by critics who often proclaimed not to like the musical in the first place, La La Land to me felt like a vapid, lifeless shell of a movie. A musical that desperately wanted to be an homage to grand musicals of yesterday, but is about as passable as a five-year-old dressed in daddy's suit. Now take for instance this opening scene on the freeway overpass. Every performer in this first shot has their face in shadow. This would have never, ever been acceptable in a production overseen by Irving Thalberg. Compared to a much less popular 2016 film, the Coen brothers hail Caesar. Now, not only do you get the sense that the Coens know the era intimately, but you feel like cinematographer Roger Deakins actually did his homework in achieving the look of that era. Unfortunately, it's a film that is really only entertaining if you really love the sordid details of the studio era. Now, my second passion behind film is music. At this point, I've been playing the trumpet for two thirds of my life. For me, the musical combines everything that's wonderful about music and brings in narrative and dance. It's a highly integrated art. 
Some of my best memories are sitting in an orchestra pit performing with my trumpet and listening to the dialogue and dissecting the way the story works. I fall in love with the characters and the story as well as maybe a few of the leading ladies, but that's a story for a different kind of show. Given the history and the tradition, it sort of pains me to conclude that the movie musical is pretty much dead. Well, the song and the dance sequences in a musical are a contrivance, an unrealistic means of expression. To paraphrase the amazing Bob Fosse, when words can no longer express emotion, the body sings. When the song isn't enough, the body dances. Well, that's okay for a theater because we are always conscious that there is a play going on right in front of us. We are constantly aware that the stage is fake and the story is make-believe. A theater company asks us, the audience, to join in and make-believe together. It's okay. And that they just suddenly broke out in a song. It's fine. But a film reaches down into something much more deeper. And the push for realism since the 70s leaves little room for song and dance. Well, next, there is a lack of trained musical talent. Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling are no Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. The movie stars of today lack the training in music and dance, and the really good triple threats of the stage just don't have the star power to draw the audiences needed for a studio to invest millions and millions of dollars. The economics just spell doom. But perhaps I am too quick to hand down the death sentence to the musical. It isn't dead at all, just transformed. Productions like High School Musical and Pitch Perfect are serving a young generation growing up on Disney films and singing in after-school choir. Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton is a cultural phenomenon, and there's very high hopes for an eventual film adaptation. Even more mainstream, the music video, basically the great-grandchild of the Force's original sound experiments, are shared and viewed billions of times. Probably the most successful videos on the web are musicals, in a sense. In Bollywood, musicals comprise the majority of Indian cinema. And who knows what tastes will come from a generation brought up where music is so heavily influenced by visuals. Perhaps I should just let it go? Let it go, let it go. Can't hold you back anymore. Let it... Leave a comment telling me which musical you're pissed that I didn't mention, and then go out there and make something musically great. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.